All right, so I'm Steve Lawrence. I run Contextual Research at State Street Global Exchange. For those of you who don't know what Contextual is, it's a word I completely made up just so that my title would look good on conference presentations. It's also a great way of trolling my coworkers who have to use made up words in their day-to-day -day interactions with me, like they're third graders in an imaginary world on the playground. But in all seriousness, Contextual is about combining the um, quantitative power of machines with the um, in contextual capabilities of human insights, subject matter experts. And my team are working continuously on a day-by-day -day basis combining these two concepts to help um, manage information overload for investment professionals. Before I get into the presentation, my background, I am a finance quant by trade. I started off as an economist working 15 years for State Street doing various forms of quantitative research. Most recently, working on a algorithmic data science product team at State Street called Contextual Research. And uh, it's really just an excuse to put machine learning onto my curriculum vitae. Um, so this presentation is one that I have um, talked with various different finance professionals, both quants and non-quants alike. Um, I've retooled it slightly for this audience. Typically, I'd spend a decent amount of time talking about data and algorithms, um, but really, at this conference, you've got far better people to listen to and hear from about that than me. So this presentation today is going to be entirely about culture. It's going to be about, I'm going to talk about applied finance as the third culture, and I'm going to talk about why it is that um, finance in particular, but data science in general, is influenced by the culture of the institution or the industry in which it operates, and why that poses some interesting challenges for finance. This is a good opportunity for me to pause and give a quick disclaimer and say that while I got all of these slides approved by my compliance team, none of the words I'm about to speak are. So anything that I say is my opinions and not those of State Street. And any uh, shade that I throw on finance quants is neither a reflection of quants at State Street or at any other organization that I've worked with. Though, as you can imagine, working for 15 years um, at State Street and going out and meeting quants around the world, I've heard my fair share of quants gone wild stories that inspired a lot of what you see in this presentation. So before we, um, before we get started, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, or really more the elephant that isn't in the room, um, what we mean by a quant in finance. Because I think all of you have got some sort of vision of what you believe quant in finance is like, based probably based on people you've met, and the two challenges with that. The first is any quant that you do meet and talk to about finance is going to tell you about the quantiest quant thing that they've done in the entire world of quant finance. And they're probably going to be exaggerating. Not everybody in who has the title quant in finance is going around creating high-frequency trading models, predicting credit default swaps with 98% accuracy, and generating trillions of dollars of revenue for their company. Your average quant has spends probably two years ago created a quant model and has now spent the past two years creating the risk analytics to support that model so they can sleep at night now that it's live. Um, the other reason that I think this is an interesting um, concept is that um, quants in finance span a huge range from people that are actually doing data science to people who probably wouldn't show up at a uh, conference like this. Um, at least not unless we had you know, sessions on Microsoft Excel comparing 2003 with its nice um, menu bars versus 2007 with the more than 16,000 rows of data allowed at any one given time. Most of the people doing quant finance are in that um, in sort of pre-data science um, class, but they have a you know, huge um, influence on the um, industry. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about how finance differs from other data sciences. I'm going to talk a little bit about how finance professionals should think about applying new techniques like machine learning. And notice how I was able to say that phrase, new techniques like machine learning, without even having a slight smirk of irony. Um, 
I'm also going to talk about how traditional sciences can adapt to working in the finance industry, something that seems to be increasingly a trend, as these three articles show here. So the first one I have here is Two Sigma hired Google's um, Alfred Spector to run its um, technology business and basically create a data science capable technology capability. Um, second one here is um, JP Morgan hired as a head of artificial intelligence uh, from uh, Microsoft. And then just as I was putting these slides together, saw an article that said the guy had left. Uh, JP Morgan to go to Facebook, presumably in some attempt to escape regulation and government oversight. <laughs> so why the third culture? So before I actually get into the heart of this uh, presentation, uh, I want to thank uh, John Arabadges, a colleague of mine at State Street, and Jeremy Achin from Data Robot, who tipped me off on these two papers. It started off in 1959 with C.P. Snow, who wrote an article called The Two Cultures, describing the difference between the scientific community and the educated yet scientifically illiterate rest of academia, and really suggesting that there was a significant problem with the way that they approached ideas of logical reasoning. And his paper caused cried a stir. It was debated for many years, culminating in 95 with um, John Brockman writing about a third culture that could hopefully come in and bridge the gap between the scientifically literate and the scientifically illiterate. Fast forward to 2001, and Leo Breiman wrote a paper titled Statistical Modeling, The Two Cultures. And he suggested that the world of classical, uh, model-driven classical statistics was um, potentially bested by an algorithmic approach, that instead of this iterative hypothesis, model, test, hypothesis, model, test, that the modern data science that we know today of algorithmically allowing the data to speak and being light on the actual uh, modeling was possibly a preferable approach. Now, you can imagine going into any campus, into the middle of a bunch of um, natural scientists and computer scientists, taking a paragraph from this paper and reading it out to um, them, and then just ducking as a culture war breaks out between the two different uh, science camps. Well, I, I, this, this, this appealed to me because in my start of my career, I started off as a mathematician trying to choose between becoming a theoretical physicist or a reformed statistician slash um, computer scientist. In the end, I turned to finance, so I did neither of them. And this is where it started to get in interesting. So as I was talking about these papers with two of my former colleagues, one of whom is a professor of AI at Roger Williams University, another is an investment professional at uh, Massprim, uh, we were suggesting that if you were to take this paper and um, present it to a typical finance professional, they would sort of laugh at you and call both of those groups nerds. It'd basically be like Star Wars fans fighting with Trekkies. In their mind, these two groups were far closer to one another than the correct solution. And you know, they've got things like 2008 and the financial crisis that they would point to and say, well, look, you know, how did that work? Quants were melting down a year before the financial um, crisis. But we decided that it would actually be a really interesting thought experiment to take the techniques that each of these uh, disciplines um, embodies, as well as the discipline and the culture that they use and do a horse race to predict uh, market volatility using financial turbulence, which is a heuristic model popular in applied finance, using a Garch model for measuring volatility, which is what you'd probably use in your risk um, department, much more of an econometric approach, and then using an elastic net blender as a way of capturing the algorithmic data science component. And we also thought about different levels of scientific rigor, more likely that in applied finance you're iteratively changing your model, trying to get a better fit, whereas um, you know, somebody who is a really focused on doing data science correctly is probably going to use holdback periods and cross-validation. And so we found a number of interesting insights, which I'm going to share at a very high level for the rest of this um, uh, presentation. Um, but I'm probably also going to cause a little bit of consternation by very much stereotyping each of these three segments. I realize that not every single person doing applied finance is um, data mining the hell out of their Excel spreadsheets and that everybody doing uh, data science is not um, stuck in a basement running uh, Linux on their, um, on their PC to calculate um, th uh, things um, that they then can't um, present in a presentation. Um, 
the, the one thing that I was uh, worried about was that I was going to accidentally say something like, you know, handing uh, machine learning to a finance uh, grant is like, um, you know, the scene in the Star Wars movie where the porgs find a lightsaber and are jumping up and down and it's staring into the barrel of it. Um, and I say that not because the um, uh, people that I work with are um, you know, particularly stupid. In fact, some of the smartest minds that I've come across in data science are working trying to solve finance problems. But it really comes down to um, incentives and why it is that people uh, do what they do. Because this is one of the things that I think it makes finance a very interesting and challenging place to do data science. You can make a lot of money with the right idea and the right luck as long as you can get people to believe in your idea in finance. And quite often, in order to actually be able to um, get people to believe in your idea, you've got to have them believing before you're able to statistically demonstrate that you are successful with your modeling. And this manifests um, incentives in two particularly interesting ways. The first is on the trading floor where it is all about speed and interpretability. So there is a bias towards simplicity. If you could have a complex model, but you cannot explain in an instant why it's working, or more importantly, when things are going wrong, whether it's broken because the model is having a bad day or broken because the model is broken, um, that's, that's a problem. And so what you typically find is that on trading floors, there is a tendency towards financial heuristics, simple transformations of data, you know, the VIX, Think of all the charts that you see on CNBC, and these are things that are easy for people to grasp, even if they're not necessarily the most predictive of what's going to happen next. When you start thinking about financial research, though, it gets a little bit trickier, a little bit harder to see where the incentives are. If you are a sell-side researcher, that's somebody producing research for a brokerage desk, you are paid by the idea. So if you have no ideas, you don't get paid. You don't last very long in your job. But as statisticians, we know that most of the time, statistics are insignificant, and those that are significant are ones that we don't understand. And in a less aggressive um, uh, data science culture, you would probably give up on that and move on to something else, or very carefully try ideas until you've found something. But in, um, you know, if you're in a fast-paced environment where you're expected to come up with new ideas on a regular basis, there is a bias towards finding something. You keep iterating your model until you find something. Most of the time, this is done in a non-quantitative way with just uh, logical reasoning and uh, conversations. But increasingly, uh, data science is coming into the sell side as well. And there is an incentive challenge there. In the buy side, it's a little um, less, um, less of a problem because you are paid by the performance. But as I said a couple of minutes ago, there is this challenge that um, when you're looking at um, your performance and trying to get people to believe in your idea, you need to have something that tells a good story and that is interpretable and that historically has been working. So there is a bias towards significance that um, as data scientists, we need to uh, think about and um, challenge. So in the remainder of this uh, presentation, I'm going to present six vignettes from the uh, paper that um, we wrote um, that really sort of get at various different things that are um, you know, worth um, you know, thinking about. And the first one that I want to um, uh, start you off with is this idea of um, the simplicity of um, financial models um, and yet the incredible amount of complexity that exists in those, um, in those models. So when we set out with this paper, our assumption was that if we went and pulled a um, decent enough um, set of uh, machine learning algorithms, various different gradient boosting um, algorithms, et cetera, off the shelf, threw them at the problem of predicting volatility, that it was going to blow the socks off a Garch model and a turbulence model. Um, the idea being that if we did enough iterative fiddling of the parameters, it was going, we were going to be able to better fit with a um, uh, machine learning approach. And we were completely wrong. The best approach was actually Garch in this situation. Turbulence was um, third. And machine learning was sort of somewhere in the middle. As we started looking into this, we realized that there's an incredible amount of intricacy in the way that feature generation is done in heuristic and financial models. You think about what goes into calculating a simple covariance matrix that's used to normalize um, the 
calculation of um, volatility in a turbulence model. And you've got all these cross terms and you've got lags all being fed into one single value that tells you whether or not we're in a turbulent period or not. If you're thinking about Gartch, it gets even more complicated. You think about all the different state variables that are being modeled just for one instance um, prediction. And these are things that if you're just taking um, individual fa features or even simple crosses of features, summation, multiplication, et cetera, the types of things that you might um, get a smart algorithm to do, you're going to run into problems pr predicting that. It's an area where you know, we've started to see various different data science companies, a couple of them outside in the hallway, that are thinking about how to do um, financial time series modeling more intelligently. Um, and you know the, the, that approach, the approach of allowing algorithms to understand about the nuances of how you can transform data to make it relevant for financial analysis, is going to be where I think the, probably the biggest growth area is going to be in uh, financial data science over the next um, couple of years. But in the interim, what do you do if you cannot, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you don't have the ability to start doing intricate um, feature modeling? Well, a simple thing that you can do is take some of the heuristic models that you already have lying around and use them as inputs into some, uh, you know, hyper model that's um, allocating between the underlying factors and these um, these models. This has two benefits. One, it's capturing the um, intricacy of those features. It's capturing some of the nuances that uh, maybe we don't fully understand exactly why it is that those uh, covariates are important, but at least we can actually capture some of the complexity of that as an input. And the second is when we start getting weights or um, outputs from a hypermodel that are basically assigning um, a weight um, in a particular part of the um, uh, feature space to a particular model, we have readily an interpretation. We already understand, or at least our traders already understand how to interpret that. So what we're really doing is sort of taking a little bit of the um, uh, trial and error out of the process of figuring out which model to, to use. On the flip side of, uh, of this, the financial heuristic models um, are great, but they tend to be light on theory, and they're not going to be the best thing for predicting what you're looking to um, predict. So they're not designed to capture the uh, dynamics that you would um, get out of a complex financial system. You know, for example, if you have a single central market that is likely to cause contagion in smaller follow-on markets, no amount of tinkering with the parameters of a um, uh, financial turbulence model is going to allow you to capture those dynamics. It's just not um, complicated enough. A simple financial heuristic like turbulence is like a metal rule. You can join two dots with it, but you can't necessarily do much more than that. Um, Garch model probably a little bit more like a um, spline curve, and then machine learning pretty much join the dots if you tinker around with it enough. Obviously, I'm not saying this in terms of rigorous data science, but in terms of just your general ability to fit the data that you have at hand, these um, heuristic models tend to be a little bit oversimplistic. And the big problem with that is, as we start getting alternative data coming in from various different sources, it, the types of heuristics, the types of models that we have aren't fully able to capture the richness of the dynamics. Think about how many news articles it takes for a doubling in the volatility of a stock price, or how many tweets it would take for a 10 basis point um, decline in stock price if these tweets were about bad corporate governance. These are things that we can model. We can create heuristics all day long to describe that relationship at various different points of the curve. But if we're going to systematically approach this, there could be millions and millions of different heuristics that we could use, billions if we're looking at it across an entire market. And it's going to be dangerous to try and fit any one of these heuristics to a particular uh, strategy. So this is an area where finance um, hasn't yet, but is you know, really coming head to head with um, the need for a more intentional approach to uh, parameter selection, and an area where you know, I think algorithmic data science is going to really be able to offer significant uh, benefits. So, um, you know, heuristics are useful, but they're not necessarily um, the best way uh, forward as we start getting, moving outside the realm of just predicting future prices with past prices, which is where they tended to get their, their start. 
The next um, fact, I think the third fact here that I would like to emphasize is um, understanding subject uh, matter domain. In fact, this may be actually where I would typically um, start. You want to know the difference between um, mathematical facts, economic facts, and everything else. It's important to understand the, um, you know, what, which, what parts of your modeling are purely mathematical. So for example, an index being the sum of its constituent parts is something that you want to hard code into your model. Something like um, the normality of returns, Black-Scholes formula, or this example that I have here of the LIBOR OIS spread is something that you want to think about including in a more um, adaptive manner. This, this is a great example. This, this statistical relationship between LIBOR and the OIS spread was something that nobody really paid a huge amount of attention to up until 2008. Now you can actually go and Google ready created graphs of this because people are talking about it. What this is is the difference between the rate at which banks lend amongst themselves and the rate at which the uh, central bank would lend um, overnight. And Generally, if there's not a huge amount of credit risk in the market, these two things are pretty much um, equal or in line with one another. But when you start to see credit stress, these things diverge. And pretty much prior to 2008, there's very little movement in this measure. This is a, something that if you had hard-coded this relationship into your model, you would struggle significantly with. So thinking about ways that you can actually allow the model to adapt to the possibility, even if it's a slim you know, once in a hundred years probability that these two things might diverge is important. But probably more important is understanding which things are facts and which things are generally held truths that could turn out to be false in the future. So the next, so sort of following on from the um, heuristic modeling, taking credit for extreme events. This is something that, um, you know, I think is a big challenge. The number of models that I see out there where somebody will basically time an on-off switch between being invested in risky assets and not being invested in risky assets. And declaring success because they predicted uh, the uh, GFC. And it doesn't matter if you have 40 years of daily data. You do not have 10,000 independent observations, particularly if 90% of your volatility is driven by 10% of your days, and those 10% of days are highly autocorrelated, so you can't trade or get in and out of those signals um, quickly enough. So a couple of things that um, you know, I encourage my team to focus on there. One is really sort of modeling in the cross-section. It's a lot harder to overfit a model when you're trying to make sure that you capture multiple different um, sectors or indices at the same time. So instead of trying to create one model for each market and fine-tune the parameters on that individual model, finding a model that can work cross-sectionally gives you a much higher uh, bar. But then if you are forced into modeling uh, things in a pure time series fashion, realizing that um, a significant amount of your overall performance statistic is driven by a few days or few, um, few, few periods of the market is important. So the other thing is just understanding the effective um, sample size of what you're, what you're modeling. This next uh, piece is based on a uh, paper that I wrote last year looking at um, trying to um, predict which uh, academic research was relevant um, for investment professionals. Um, and it's got a couple of insights that I think are useful here. So we had a number of researchers read uh, academic papers with an investment uh, bent and then figure out whether they were worth talking to um, our clients about. And uh, we modeled this in a very simple way. I looked at, um, you know, created a word vector, did uh, SVM, and um, ultimately found a model that was, you know, had a high, high 70s correlation with the uh, predictions of um, a, uh, you know, human uh, reading it. So we're able to create a decent, uh, decent enough model, but the question was well, really what is the upper bound for um, measuring um, you know, something like this? And the upper bound is not 100%, the upper bound is the consistency of humans. And this is where human error comes in because probably the biggest mistake that I made in my career at State Street was I have a team that reads through maybe 3,000 papers a year and I had them read through 1,000 papers one year the following year, 
told my intern to download papers from a thousand paper conference and forgot to tell them to update the script to download this year's conference and not last year's conference. So I had an entire team, I don't even want to think about how much this cost, reading through academic papers for weeks and months only to realize right as we went to publish that we had already read these papers a year ago. And this was an absolute disaster from a business. Um, I, I kept it secret until I had the paper written. Because, uh, but it turned out to be a really good data set because what it did was it gave us the ability to understand if you create an editorial process, a the process which we go through to get that human opinion is very rigorous with multiple layers of, um, you know, error checking and, you know, validating human consistency. And we were only able to get 83% correlation in our, um, uh, human, um, you know, yes, no filtering. And so there's two, I think there's two pieces, two pieces of information that we can actually take away from this. One is that, um, you know, humans are, as, as, as a data scientist, there's going to be times when you make mistakes. There's going to be times when you, um, you know, generate um, errors. And you need to be aware of those uh, mistakes because even if you have the most rigorous data science uh, practice in your mind, at some point you're going to realize that everything that you did was wrong and you're going to have to think about, well, what does this mean? What should I do to change things for the way that my, um, you know, how, how, how do I describe this to my um, uh, clients? You know, how, at what point do I go back and redo my results and how do I uh, convey this to people? These are things that the influences, the um, incentives that you have, and the culture becomes very important. These are things you want to think up beforehand and you want to be ready for because they're generally going to come right as you're getting ready for publication. And that's a, that's a real, um, real challenge. So then I'll leave you with this final um, thought. So we spent a decent amount of time talking to people as we were doing this paper. We really wanted to understand not just how um, da data scientists in the um, computer science field were approaching these problems, but how financial professionals were approaching them. We talked to people ranging from professors to finance professionals, um, Kaggle grandmasters. Um, we, we spent a decent amount of time just hanging around the data robot um, uh, booth generally to get their mind on how they do things. But what we did find was that there was, um, while there was a lot of uh, commonality in the opinions that um, people had, there were certain areas where people didn't have a good solid understanding of how to address a problem. You know, how do you um, handle it if your cross-validation results differ significantly from your holdout period? At what point do you tell your clients that the model is not um, internally consistent? How different um, does it have to be before you actually should care? These are things that we have general data science ideas, but they're significantly influenced by the culture and the um, incentive structure that is played on us. So these are things that you probably want to have a conversation about with somebody in your organization before you get into the middle of modeling and you're now arguing about a statistic that you haven't really had a chance to think about. But I'll leave, leave you with this uh, final thought, and I think this is you know, sort of a good way of um, tying this up. As we talked to all these different people, we were able to actually take pieces from each of the different um, cultures that we were talking to and bring them together and actually create some you know, ideas and paths forward that actually helped us to navigate some of these challenges. And so I'd actually encourage you, in the um, spirit of John Brockman, to really think about your role as a data scientist in finance as being that third culture, bridging between the traditional data scientists and the industry that you're in, making sure that you don't lose track of the incentives or the um, best practices in either one of them. So I'll pause there and take any uh, questions about this, uh, this presentation. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of it comes down to setting the expectations up front and really having a minimum standard of what you're going to um, accept as a data scientist when working in the finance world. Because there, 
there is, you know, there's, there is a reason why you have the scientific rigor that you do when you're doing this modeling. There is a, you know, a reputation risk that you're putting on the line by allowing yourself to dilute your science. And I think it's really important that you find um, people that actually, they, they generally they will understand the concept of reputational risk, but they won't understand what reputational risk means in the world of um, financial modeling. So you either have to explain the risk from a, you know, what happens if you lose all your money because you overfit a model, as well as the risk of losing, um, uh, you know, the ability for people to take you seriously. So a lot of it comes down to preemptive um, you know, set, setting of goals and then just really setting ground rules. Talk about, you know, what, how you're going to handle it when uh, people screw up, you know, setting up expectations. And particularly in research, I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges. This idea that you know, people like projects where this project is going to take six months and at the end of it, we are going to have a solution that we know works. When in reality, a research project may take six months and yield no actionable um, result. And that's something which um, you know, has taken a long time. I mean, as I say, I've been at State Street for 15 years, and we've had some projects where we've uh, been successful and other projects where we haven't. And it's been important for us to be able to sort of manage expectations because it's a lot easier to do that um, at the beginning than to run out of time and say, um, uh, oh, crap, we're going to have absolutely nothing for you this year. So those, those are the sort of challenges that um, we're really working on. Let's see. So I think I'm at, um, at, uh, at time now. So um, I really appreciate um, your time. If you have any questions, feel free to catch me outside. Um, but thank you for coming to the session.